Josh, it's so good to see you, my dear friend. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Likewise. Thank you for bringing me in. Terrific. Um, our participants are uh, entering the, the Zoom room. Uh, let me begin by acknowledging a few of them. Of course, all of them are great and dear friends of HRNK, our mission, great supporters of our mission. Um, let me acknowledge uh, Professor David Maxwell, uh, board member of uh, the U.S. Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. Uh, let me also acknowledge uh, Lieutenant General Chip Gregson, who is again joining us for, um, for a, an HRNK Zoom program, former commandant of the U.S. Marine Corps in the Asia Pacific. Uh, so many other great and uh, dear friends, uh, Marcus Nolan of the Peterson Institute, um, HRNK board member, Professor Yi Song Yun my uh, Jedi master and our great friend. My mother is joining us from Romania. Um, again, this is, uh, this is going to be a great program. I know that uh, quite a few other board members will be here very soon, but um, let me begin by uh, introducing our speaker today. Um, John Stanton uh, is the author of a um, seminal HRNK report, uh, Arsenal of Terror 2015. Uh, this is, of course, a report about North Korea role, North, the North Korean role as a state sponsor of terrorism. Um, it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that to establish actually a legal standard for listing uh, a state as a state sponsor of terror. Uh, Josh has continued to be a very dear friend of HRNK. We have stayed in touch. Um, of course, we all know that he's an attorney in Washington, D.C. He has 24 years of military and civilian experience in uh, criminal and civil litigation and administrative law. He served as a, a U.S. Army judge advocate in Korea for four years, 1998 to 2002. We are all familiar with his writing, his blog. Um, he, uh, he pioneered um, the, um, the, the use of satellite imagery of um, North Korean political prison camps at about the same time that HRNK was working on Hidden Gulag. Uh, he has been cited in multiple prestigious publications as published op-eds in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Foreign Policy, the Weekly Standard, CNN International, many times together with our good friend, Professor Isom Yun of the Fletcher School, um, who has joined us tonight and has also spoken um, for this program just a few weeks ago. Um, uh, most importantly, uh, Josh assisted uh, the U.S. House of Representatives, in particular Committee on Foreign Affairs, with the drafting of the North Korea Sanctions Enforcement Act of 2014. Uh, most importantly, I would like to remind our distinguished participants that the views that Josh is going to express are his own. His views do not represent views of uh, any organization or government agency. Spoiler alert, uh, Josh has finalized another draft for HRNK, so another Josh Stanton report is in the works, approaching the very final stages of publication, so uh, we will see him again very soon. Um, once Josh is done with the keynote presentation, we'll proceed with the Q&A and use the chat and the Q&A fa function to ask questions. If you want to ask questions in advance, that is perfectly fine. Your moderator is going to take those questions and relay them to the speaker. Josh, without further ado, welcome. Thank you so much for spending this precious time with us. On to you. Thank you, Greg, for your kind invitation. Uh, throughout the 1970s and the 1980s, North Korea was a very prolific uh, supporter of terrorist organizations, including the, the Japanese Red Army, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, Hezbollah, and the real IRA. Uh, it also became a prolific executor of terrorist attacks uh, through its own government organizations. So, for example, we initially had 
events like the 1970 Lod Airport massacre, where North Korea armed and trained Japanese Red Army terrorists who collaborated in that attack. Later, North Korean agents carried out a bombing in Rangoon that killed multiple South Korean officials. They bombed an airliner uh, that was on its way uh, to the Olympics in 1987, killing everyone aboard the airplane. And as a result of that, President Reagan put North Korea on the list of state sponsors of terrorism in 1988. Now, what does that list do? Uh, in ascending order of importance, first, uh, a listed state loses access to U.S. foreign assistance and arms sales except for humanitarian assistance that's considered to be urgent. The United States government must oppose assistance to the state from international financial institutions. The state loses its sovereign immunity from tort suits for its acts of terrorism and torture. Uh, and, and for North Korea, those suits have become quite significant and now total uh, well over $2 billion in liability that lawyers are trying to collect out of North Korean government funds. And finally, and I think most importantly, uh, transactions with a listed state sponsor of terrorism have to be licensed by the Treasury Department under the regulations of 31 CFR Part 596. Uh, an unlicensed transaction is a criminal violation under 18 U.S.C. 2332D, which is in the U.S. Criminal Code. So uh, after uh, North Korea was listed, uh, this coincided or, or, or was soon followed by a period in which the U.S. State Department tried to engage with North Korea in nuclear negotiations and began apparently, as you can see from uh, the record, uh, to offer rescission of North Korea's listing as a state sponsor of terrorism as an inducement to negotiate. And the record is that the State Department is required by law to produce annual reports. They're called country reports on terrorism. And almost every year, uh, starting in the, I would say the 1990s, the State Department began to say that North Korea has not been known to have committed an act of terrorism uh, since, or supported acts of terrorism since 1987. Now, this was untrue. Uh, the most significant case that I would point to and often pointed to was the abduction and murder in China, from China to North Korea, of a U.S. permanent resident, the Reverend Kim Dong Shik. Uh, the best reports that we have from defectors is that he was brought to a military base near Pyongyang and uh, essentially tortured and starved to death. His family later sued in a U.S. federal court. They won a large judgment, and they too are in the process of collecting that judgment against the North Korean government, which never showed up to oppose the suit. Um, in, uh, in the course of the nuclear negotiations, North Korea eventually won uh, what it wanted, the concession that it wanted, and it did, in fact, uh, get convince the State Department and President Bush to rescind its designation. North Korea was removed from the list in October of 2008, and at the time of the rescission, uh, President Bush and, in fact, uh, then-Senator Barack Obama promised that if North Korea did not follow through on its denuclearization promises, that they would put North Korea back on the list. Eight years later, uh, I think the, the story of North Korea's denuclearization speaks for itself, but North Korea did not go back on the list. Now let's talk about what North Korea did in the way of terrorism during the years that followed North Korea's rescission, because what we saw was in effect uh, a, an expansion of North Korea's terrorist activities in the years after its rescission from the list. And before we get into the specifics, it would be useful to stop and talk about the definition of international terrorism. Because as the report, as the 2015 report describes in 
much greater detail than I'm going to go into in this discussion. There are multiple definitions in the law, and none of them are clear, and none of them are consistent. The best of them is in the U.S. Criminal Code. And taking the U.S. Criminal Code definition and combining it with the other elements that are in the Foreign Assistance Act and other places, we can come to a very conservative, narrowly drawn, lowest common denominator definition that has five elements. Number one, the act must be violent or a threat of immediate violence. Number two, the act has to be unlawful in the place where it's committed. Number three, it has to be committed by clandestine agents or subnational groups. So acts of war, acts by uniform military forces don't count. Number four, the act has to have been committed with the intent to coerce a government or a civilian population. And then finally, to qualify as an act of international terrorism justifying a listing, it must involve the citizens or the territory of more than one country. So reviewing the list, uh, the 2015 report found multiple examples of North Korea either plotting the assassination of human rights advocates, a South Korean military officer, an attempt to murder the, the well-known activist Pak sung Hak uh, through an agent carrying a needle loaded with a toxin called neostigmine bromide, uh, one successful murder of a human rights advocate in China, an attempt to murder another using the same poison that was not successful, and then finally, what we had uh, was the 2014 cyber attack uh, against uh, the movie The Interview, uh, to which I would ask, have you seen any good movies about North Korea lately? This was, I think, the most successful foreign attack on freedom of expression in the United States. You might say that The Interview was not a good movie, and you would be right, it wasn't, uh, although it had its moments. Uh, but what we have now is a situation in which American film studios are chilled and frightened out of making movies about North Korea, including better movies that, that we might rather prefer to watch and maybe even watch with our families. Uh, so there were multiple examples that were cited and that were never mentioned in any of the annual State Department reports that justified a listing of North Korea as a sponsor of terrorism. So there were two reactions to this, one from Congress and one from North Korea. And let's start with that one because it's the more interesting one. So the reviews were not favorable and Greg and I, I'm sure have both paid up our life insurance policies since then, but uh, uh, it, it, was, it was really my great honor to be denounced by the Korean Central News Agency on, of all days, May Day of 2015. Uh, they said, quote, lurking behind the motives of the, quote, Commission for Human Rights in North Korea to make public the report and build up public opinion on it is its sinister purpose to tarnish the image of the DPRK by branding it as a sponsor of terrorism. Now that the US has failed to demonize it over the so-called nuclear and human rights issue, such a plot breeding body produced a conspiratorial document as part of its desperate campaign to label the DPRK a sponsor of terrorism. This is no more than the last ditch effort of those hell bent on the smear campaign of the DPRK. It went on to describe the report as an unpardonable, politically motivated prop, uh, provocation uh, and said that the U.S. was actually the real terrorist because it hosts so-called political exiles and dissidents. Again, May 1st, 2015. Could it have been better? Well, the other reaction was from Congress, which in 2017 passed a consolidated sanctions law it had three titles uh, for Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Uh, it was called the uh, Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act of 2017, 
and Section 324 of that act required the president, by this time President Trump, to uh, determine whether North Korea had met the statutory uh, uh, standard to be designated as a state sponsor of terrorism. And around the time that that deadline in the, in the statute was running out, President Trump, in fact, did designate North Korea as a state sponsor of terrorism. Now, it's interesting to ask first, was it the right decision uh, and was it justified uh, based on the right reasons? Let's first back up a step to say that even after the publication of Arsenal of Terror, but before North Korea's rescission, it continued to escalate its conduct. Um, in 2015, for example, South Korean prosecutors indicted three South Korean men for apparently conspiring, uh, and this had been back in 2010, to murder Hwang jong yup uh, who was, of course, the senior North Korean defector who had uh, claimed to be the progenitor of the Juche ideology. In 2015, uh, according to a South Korean press report, China arrested reconnaissance general bureau agents who are trying to kidnap defectors or uh, and a South Korean pastor uh, inside China. Uh, there were reports of hacking into the South Korean subway. Uh, and then in 2016 came the axe murder of Pastor Han chung uh, a Chinese national. There was in 2016 a report that the North Koreans had ordered a, a, the murder of a man named Ko Young Hwan, a former North Korean diplomat who had defected to the Congo. So keeping North Korea off the list uh, during this interim period certainly did not uh, improve their behavior and the evidence that they had reformed was uh, contraindicated. And then along comes February 2017th, when we have arguably the most dangerous incident of all, when North Korea uh, killed Kim Jong-nam with VX nerve agent in the Kuala Lumpur airport. Now, the story that has emerged is that North Korea tricked a Vietnamese uh, woman and an Indonesian woman into smearing Mr. Kim's face with two binary parts of the VX compound that combine to form this nerve agent that's so powerful, uh, it's considered to be a weapon of mass destruction. Those of you who have children know that kids put their hands and their mouths all over things that they probably shouldn't, that are dirty, um, that are unclean. Uh, you have to just stop and consider how many innocent lives were endangered with this terrible, deadly substance in this crowded airport terminal. There's no reasonable doubt that the North Koreans were responsible for this. Four of their nationals fled Malaysia the day of the attack. One of them that the Malaysian authorities wanted for questioning was a man named Hyun Kwang Song, who was a second secretary at the embassy. The Malaysian police said that someone had tried to break into the mortuary to steal the body. And in March of 2018, in fact, the State Department officially determined that North Korea had in fact used the ex nerve agent to murder Kim Jong-nam in the Kuala Lumpur airport. So we now have our first case of a foreign government using a weapon of mass destruction to commit a terrorist act. We've entered a new era. And I don't think as a country and as a government, we have quite come to terms with that. Uh, so, uh, why was North Korea designated in 2017? I, I, in part, it was because of the Kuala Lumpur attack. That was a case of right decision and right reason. Uh, now, the president also cited a, a number of other things that were uh, arguably not acts of international terrorism under the definition that I would propose. Uh, you know, the, the, the killing of Otto Warmbier was a, was a horrible thing. Um, I think that the evidence that the judge cited in her opinion supports that it was intentional 
or the result of, of torture. Um, probably whatever North Korea does inside North Korea is not illegal under North Korean law, so it might not fit the definition. Uh, North Korea's nuclear threats, well, are, are you going to count only an imminent threat as an act of terrorism or not? I think you can parse that either way. Uh, the point being that Congress still has not clarified the definitions. And that's too bad because Congress missed the perfect opportunity to do that in 2018 when it passed the Export Control Reform Act, which essentially recodified the old 6J of the Export Administration Act. Uh, so that was a missed opportunity to define not only international terrorism, but to define what support for international terrorism means. Similarly, more missed opportunities in the State Department's annual reports for 2018 and 2019 that really told us very little about the conduct that North Korea had to stop engaging in to be removed from the list. And, and without clarifying that, what incentive does Pyongyang have to stop sending assassins to kill human rights activists or to stop censoring freedom of expression in the United States itself or to, to, to stop using weapons of mass destruction in countries that are relatively friendly to North Korea as Malaysia was. So what should we do about all of this? Well, first, it is important for Congress to continue to send the message to the State Department that if they are not clear, that Congress will take more control. Uh, the State Department does not appreciate when Congress micromanages policy, but if the, the State Department continues to issue vague reports that do not meet the purpose of the statute, uh, what is Congress supposed to do to carry out its policy prerogatives? Uh, Congress could do more to define both international terrorism and support for it. The 2015 report continues to have that model legislation language. I have an updated version if someone is interested in, in advancing that. A second thing that the government could do is it could start using a specific authority called Executive Order 13224 against North Korean officials who engage in or support acts of terrorism. People like Kim Young Chul, who is mentioned in the 2015 report and who subsequently had talks with both Mike Pompeo and President Trump. Uh, Kim Young chul was the former head of the Reconnaissance General Bureau and a person who was implicated in multiple terrorist attacks, including the Sony hack. Um, uh, extradition, such as the recent extradition of Moon chul myung from Malaysia, really sends a chill up the spines of North Korean diplomats because when North Koreans are extradited by governments that want to have friendly relations with the United States, North Korea has to be concerned about what those people will tell FBI agents and prosecutors in order to get more lenient treatment as criminal defendants always try to negotiate. Um, that is one way that you can uproot a network of North Korean nationals. Uh, there is a specific statutory amendment that would be helpful. I mentioned before that it is a criminal violation to have an unlicensed transaction with a government that is a listed state sponsor of terrorism. But in order to give that statute the reach you need, you have to attach it to the civil forfeiture authorities. And without stringing all of that together, a small amendment in the money laundering statute at 18 U.S.C. 1956 would make it so that a person involved in a transaction with a terrorist state uh, would uh, put the proceeds of that transaction or property involved in that transaction at risk of forfeiture and confiscation by the United States. Um, so there are things that we can do. Uh, and, and that we have not done, I think the most important thing that we can do is speak the truth. Stand up for the people who are in places like Yanji, China, 
or increasingly on the southern side of the DMZ and trying to stand up for the human rights of the people in North Korea. They are now uh, North Korea's targets, and I suspect that they will continue to be targets to a greater degree. I mentioned the wave of assassinations in uh, South Korea between, say, around 2008 and 2010. Recently, the Moon government has largely dismantled South Korea's counterintelligence capabilities and handed that function over to the Korean National Police, who are not trained, equipped, or suited to take up that mission. I think the withdrawal of that protection is going to fall very heavily on emigre activists, uh, you know, the people who come from North Korea and tell us the truth about what is happening in their homeland. So the truth matters. The, the words the administration uses matters. Uh, diplomacy with North Korea will, of course, eventually be important. But let's not forget diplomacy about North Korea either, because that is how we're going to conform North Korea to the standards of civilization. And one of the most important standards is you will not get your way by killing, by threatening, and by attacking the people who call on you to change the way you behave. Thank you. Well, Josh, thank you very much. Uh, terrific as uh, always. Um, actually, the, uh, the first question is coming from uh, Lieutenant General Chip Gregson, um, currently with uh, General Atomics EMS, again, former commander of the U.S. Marine Corps in the Asia Pacific. Uh, the question is, you mentioned Kim Jong-nam, the assassination of the half-brother in Malaysia. So in addition to killing Kim Jong-nam, was this VX attack also a message to Malaysia and others to tread lightly on any actions against DPRK operations in their countries, against North Korean operations in their countries? So uh, it's, it's always very hard for me to psychoanalyze the North Koreans because Malaysia is one of their most important trading partners, uh, a government that has historically been really very lax in its enforcement of UN Security Council sanctions. Uh, they have a lot of trade with North Korea in coal and, and you know, they, they have, for example, laborers. Who, who work in the coal mines in Sarawak as, as virtual slaves. They have very important money laundering fronts, including Malaysia Korea Partners and Glocom that operate out of Malaysia. I, I don't understand how North Korea, how Kim Jong-un could have rationally concluded that this attack was in his interests. I, I think by appealing to greed they have historically been able to get the things they wanted from people or, or simply by making the engagement argument, no matter how unsuccessful it has ultimately been if you look at the whole historical context. You know, sometimes you have to resort to Occam's razor and to say that an act may simply have been irrational and temperamental. And I can't imagine that the North Koreans must have wanted the extradition of Moon Chun Myung to go forward. That, that has got to have scared them a lot. And in fact, it resulted in their decision to break diplomatic relations with Malaysia. This astonishes me, really, uh, that Malaysia, despite being uh, the, the, the venue for this first state-sponsored terrorist attack using a weapon of mass destruction was not the one that terminated diplomatic relations with North Korea, but it was North Korea that uh, made the decision to terminate relations with Malaysia. So uh, I'm not sure that I see enough evidence to say that the warning was to Malaysia. Now, there has been a lot of press reporting that Kim Jong-nam was apparently talking to U.S. intelligence services. I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, I, I think that Kim Jong-nam's intelligence value is probably no more than knowing 
about how the inner court works and how Kim Jong-un thinks. And that's all to the good because it helps us to predict the behavior of an unpredictable person and wars come from miscalculations. So it may well be that that's, uh, th that it's a combination of their uh, concern that he was talking to the Americans and perhaps their concern that he might be someone in the bloodline who was a, a potential replacement for Kim Jong-un himself. Josh, thank you, and thank you, General Gregson. The next one comes from Professor Sandra Fahey at Sophia University in Japan, also a, uh, a speaker for this program with uh, Professor Lee Song yoon just a few weeks ago. The, the Constitution of the Republic of Korea stipulates, Article 3, that all Korean territory is Republic of Korea territory. Um, Sandra's question is, would it be possible to press South Korea to push North Korea harder for crimes against humanity, since this is arguably happening within ROK territory. And the Republic of Korea is a signatory to the 2002 Rome Statute, and thus this might imply international criminal court jurisdiction, of course. So it's a great question, and it's one that I've thought about. And let me give you the, the short answer, which is no, not under this current South Korean government. There is, there is absolutely no chance of that, uh, which you already know. Uh, but there was a special tribunal involving Cambodia many years ago because China would not agree to an ICC referral of the Khmer Rouge, which it had sponsored. And so... Uh, there was under some different mechanism, I think it may have been endorsed by the General Assembly, a special tribunal set up in Cambodia. I had written publicly in one of my blog posts about the possibility of a Cambodia-like tribunal based on that very same constitutional provision, saying that all of Korea is uh, at least claimed by the South Korean constitution as being a part of the Republic of Korea. So in theory, and with the right South Korean government, that is a credible threat. Uh, under the Moon administration, it is an impossibility. Thank you, Josh. Uh, now let me, uh, let me try uh, a question from the moderator, from me. So uh, if, if you look at your... Um, 2005 report at Arsenal of Terror, you address uh, one very important issue, the, uh, the particular issue of uh, a North Korea-Iran relationship. At that time, you thought that um, no compelling evidence of a North Korea-Iran relationship had been published in open sources. A few weeks ago, Professor Bruce E. Bechtold Jr. of Angelo State University spoke to the same group uh, for our program. Uh, and of course, in the meantime, in 2018, he published North Korean military proliferation in the Middle East and Africa, enabling violence and instability. This was University Press of Kentucky. Now, that this open source information is available, in particular, Professor Bechtold's 2018 book. Uh, what thoughts or recommendations would you have for addressing North Korean proliferation to the Middle East in particular? Professor Bechtel spoke about a rising China, North Korea, Iran proliferation nexus. Mm -hmm. So uh, in 2015, the evidence that I considered best was probably that published by the Congressional Research Service. Um, I, I think probably... The, the evidence that I would rely on now comes from the UN panel of experts. And that evidence has quite recently shown a very strong nexus between Iran and North Korea on missiles in particular. I think on missiles, the case has for some years been much stronger than it, than it has been on nuclear weapons. There, there have been certainly reports of nuclear cooperation between Iran and North Korea. Enough has leaked into the open sources that people like me have been able to read it and understand that there was a lot of debate within the intelligence community. I, I, I really 
think that the issue of proliferation between two states does not meet the definition of terrorism because terrorism involves uh, subnational groups or clandestine agents. Um, but I think the case is probably fairly overwhelming that Iran and North Korea are cooperating on ballistic missiles. And as far as nuclear weapons, I'm just not well read enough on it, unfortunately, to draw a conclusion. And frankly, Bruce Bechtel knows that topic so much better than I do that I would defer to him. Thank you, Josh. A uh, question from my colleague, uh, Amanda Mortwood, O, HRNK human rights attorney. Um, are you aware of any measures of, uh, you know, something along the lines of the US SSOT list, state sponsors of terrorism, any measures that our European allies might be considering in order to address uh, or to respond to North Korean acts of terrorism? And are there any opportunities to build transatlantic bridges dealing with North Korean acts of terrorism and countering those acts of terrorism? So I, I wish I had more knowledge of European Union law than I do. And I want to be very careful not to go beyond uh, in my expertise. I do know that the European Union has recently imposed human rights sanctions uh, on North Korea and has shown some receptivity to um, uh, being more cooperative, I think, with uh, the United States and other like-minded governments to help uh, put North Korea's nuclear proliferation back in the bottle. Um, if you see terrorism as a human rights issue, and so much of North Korea's terrorism really is a human rights issue, I see tremendous potential for the two governments to cooperate. Uh, you know, when North Korea murders people like, um, you know, the, the Reverend Kim Dong-shik or the activists that it attacked in China or Park sung hak that's an, that, you know, that's an attack on human rights advocates. When North Korea does things like suppress the interview, which, by the way, it did in Europe as well as in the United States and many other countries around the world, it's attacking free speech all over the world. So uh, whether or not the EU has a mechanism like the SSOT list specifically, uh, I look, I know that they do have anti-terrorism sanctions. I don't believe they have something equivalent to the SSOT list, but they certainly uh, can, can, we can find common ground with the European Union and the United Kingdom on the fact that terrorist attacks on critics of a repressive regime or human rights activists are, is sanctionable conduct. And that's all completely consistent with what the UN Commission of Inquiry also recommended. Josh, thank you. In your report, you do mention the chemical weapons attacks in Syria um, the next question comes from Bill Newcomb. Would cooperation with Syria in the production and use of chemical weapons qualify as terrorism? <clears throat> I, I think the answer to that is uh, on North Korea's part, no. North Korea's act is to share chemical weapons uh, with Syria. And the act that Syria committed was certainly not an act of international terrorism. It was an attack on its own domestic population. It was clearly, look, if you were to ask me, would qualify as a crime against humanity. So it's a bad thing. It's a different bad thing. But in order to qualify as terrorism, it has to be uh, you know, an, an attack by the designated state against the civilian population of another country with the intent to coerce the civilian population, North Korea's intent was quite simply to make money. They're death merchants. Uh, but in this particular case, I don't think they were acting as terrorists. But it's an interesting case. Um, I have been a consultant to the Justice Department. I worked with them 
uh, on a civil forfeiture case that did in fact involve North Korean proliferation of Syria. Uh, there was a case where the uh, North Korean COMID agents who were based in Burma were working with a Taiwanese proliferator to ship vacuum dryer furnaces and all kinds of very sensitive machine tools through a port in China, then eventually to Burma where they were offloaded and then reboxed with a different packing list and sent to a company in Damascus called Mechanical Systems. And you may remember their name from your time on the panel of experts because the panel found that they were a subsidiary of the Syrian Scientific and Research, Research Corporation. I, I may be getting that acronym a little bit wrong, but SSRC is a UN designated Syrian proliferator. So the, the issue of North Korea's proliferation, I think is well established. By the way, the scariest case of North Korean proliferation was the El Kibar nuclear reactor that was destroyed by the Israelis in 2007, right as President Bush was signing the North Korea nuclear deal that year. Um, had that reactor not been blown up, it would have fallen into the hands of ISIS a few years later. It was up near Deir al Zur, which was uh, an ISIS stronghold for years. Uh, and I, I think, you know, my involvement in that particular civil forfeiture case, not a lot of money, by the way, nonetheless illustrates how using the civil forfeiture laws, which have a longer jurisdictional reach, allows us to disrupt the financial chains that bind these proliferation networks together. Josh, back to you again from Bill Newcomb. What if North Korea was involved in the chemical attacks in Syria? And in fact, I have read some press reports to that effect. I just don't have enough detail to really give it the, 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 the ring of uh, specificity and credibility. So I'm not going to say one way or another whether I believe those reports are true. But what I have seen are reports that North Korean technicians were involved in using missiles and flying aircraft. I don't know what those missiles or aircraft's payloads were, whether they were barrel bombs or you know, chemical weapons or conventional explosives. I, th that much detail I haven't read. If in fact it were the case, however, uh, what is North Korea's purpose in sending what would effectively be mercenaries to kill civilians in Syria? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty conservative in how I make, uh, you know, my own, what I would say, uh, you know, non-binding charging judgments here. I, I still think this is a case of North Korea doing it, the government of North Korea doing it for the money. Now, the state sponsors of terrorism list has historically not been that strict, as strict as I think I've been in my analysis. And one of the things that I did in my 2015 report was I went down the list of, of different types of conduct that had been used to justify an SSOT designation against, say, Iran or Iraq or Syria or other states. And so what you're describing in terms of proliferation or, or you know, using chemical weapons against Syria might actually meet that looser State Department standard. I'm advocating for a tight standard. And, and what I also advocate for is that if, if a thing is a bad thing that we want to sanction, uh, then, then let's call that something. Let's, let's create a different designation for that. So a, a, a state that uses weapons of mass destruction against a civilian population, there, there should be some sanction for that. But I believe in being very, very clear about legal language. So I would say there, there is a need for Congress to step in and create an authority if the authorities that we have aren't clear enough. Thank you, Josh. The next three questions will come from Professor Maxwell, from Professor Isong Yun at the Fletcher School, and from my colleague, Rosa Park. I'm going to go to Professor Maxwell's question first. Um, 
what new laws does Congress need to enact? Uh, what new authorities mm. does Congress need to provide state justice treasury for the intelligence community to counter the full spectrum of malign activity from a broad range of threats, proliferation, terrorism, and human rights abuses, or uh, asks Professor Maxwell, do we simply need to more effectively enforce existing laws? So the answer is yes um, uh, to both. Um, so I, I am very fearful that during the Trump administration in particular, we tried to do a lot of things and, and not do any of them very well. Um, so what we had is we had some financial enforcement, we had some maritime enforcement, we had some diplomacy to get the North Koreans thrown out of Africa where they're selling arms. We had some intermittent attempts at the United Nations to you know, raise North Korea's human rights abuses and tie the state's legitimacy to the way it treated the people. But there was never a focus. There was never a strategy. It was always too many things and not enough focus on any particular vulnerability. Now, if you're asking me what else could we do sanctions wise, uh, I don't want to steal too much of my own thunder because what I have submitted to Greg for the next report contains a pretty extensive set of model legislation. And even that itself isn't everything that I have in my hard drive. Uh, so what I have learned from the experience of the last uh, eight years is that the way to get legislation through Congress is to be ready when Congress is ready to pass legislation. What will happen is there will be a nuclear test or a missile test, and in every member's office, CNN will be on if it's a Democrat, and Fox will be on if it's a Republican, and all the news will be about North Korea, and the member will call us staffer and who does foreign affairs and say, I want to introduce a bill. And then you have to be ready to give them a good idea instead of a bad idea. One good idea, I think, uh, would be to ban transactions incident to tourist travel. Uh, this is something that North Korea has recently used as a sanctions dodge. I, I think the most important thing we could do would be to pass a law that would allow the federal government to take the proceeds of misspent, essentially proceeds of Kim Jong-il's kleptocracy and set them aside for food, medicine, and humanitarian aid, provided North Korea was ready to reform enough to let, it, let us distribute that humanitarian assistance to the needy people of North Korea. And when we see Kim Jong-un do things like close off the country's borders and starve his own people, Understand that he does that because he's still getting the things that he wants that maintain his grip on power. If, if he were to lose access to the global economy, uh, he would have to make the choice to, to conform his spending habits to the needs of his people. But he isn't going to lose that access until our government is willing to do the thing that, that you also suggested, which is enforce the law. Um, throughout the Obama administration, the second Obama administration, there was a well-orchestrated, well-resourced, well-enforced campaign against banks in the European Union that were violating Iran sanctions. And you would frequently see penalties in the you know nine digits and in one case uh against bmp pariba the french bank uh, 11 billion dollars in fines penalties and forfeitures paid to several u.s government agencies uh the state of new york and then there was so much money left over the government couldn't spend it and had to create a special victims compensation fund with the money so there is potentially a tremendous amount of money out there and again, not to get too far ahead of myself, there is enough money easily to feed the people of, of North Korea. I think it was Marcus Noland, in fact, one of your board members, who uh, told the UN Commission of Inquiry that something like 0.3% of North Korea's GDP would have been sufficient to 
feed every single North Korean. Uh, so this is a government that is not capable of making ethical decisions about how to spend money. And I think that we need to uh, require North Korea to make better decisions. And I think that this is something that a coalition really needs to do together. Josh, thank you. The next one is from Professor Lee Song Yun at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Of course, the, the entire human rights community here has been up in arms over the, the gag law in South Korea dictated by uh, Kim Yo Jong, basically. <laughs> Um, so the rationale here seems to be that uh, basically by sending in uh, toothpaste, uh, soap, socks, rice, Bibles via balloons into North Korea, this may provoke North Korean border guards to shoot at civilian activists and mm -hmm. residents. There is this rationale about potentially harming the safety and lives of the people. But Professor... Lee's point is, wouldn't this gag law actually further encourage North Korean terrorist threats if this is the rationale that's being used here? Well, my friend Professor Lee throws me a softball because he knows that we co-wrote an op-ed in 2015 uh, saying exactly that. And in fact, I think if you go back to the op-ed, it had a terrible title. We didn't pick the title. It was called a North Korean con job. It had nothing to do with the con job, sorry, 2014. Um, it, it, it had to do with defending freedom of speech by North Korean emigres. Um, and by the way, some of that speech is more than, you know, toothbrushes and, and dollar bills and bags of rice. Some of it is fairly strident. Uh, I'm the last one who's going to object to that. And by the way, if, if your attack on freedom of speech is really to say that, well, the speech isn't good. I don't agree with the speech. You don't understand free speech and how free speech works. Freedom of speech means uh, the, 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 the price that we pay for speaking freely is that we have to tolerate views that we don't agree with. There, there are narrow exceptions for speech that encourages uh, imminent lawless action and violence, uh, you know, defamation if it meets the New York Times versus Sullivan standard. But what the North Korean emigres are doing, not only with the bags of rice, but with their politically strident leaflets, the ones that call for the downfall of Kim Jong-un, uh, they are doing what is protected under Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They, they, are, they are doing what is within the spirit of Article 21 of the South Korean Constitution. Uh, look, the best legal analysis of, of this law and, and why it is wrong uh, comes from your own Amanda Mortwood O. Oh, I thought that was a tremendous and very complete study that she did. But you know, when we, we have this concept in America called the heckler's veto, North Korea is really the ultimate example of the heckler's veto by which uh, when one party is willing to engage in violence to stop another person from speaking peacefully, uh, you reward the heckler. You reward the person who engages in violence. And if you keep doing that, you're not going to have any more free speech you will incentivize violence. You will incentivize threats. You don't blame the person who speaks for the person who reacts violently to the speech. The North Koreans have agency. They are making a decision. And the South Koreans are also making a decision. They are making a series of decisions, each of which will in isolation seem like a perfectly pragmatic thing to do at the time until you have a transformation from a, a democratic South Korea to something that is starting to look more like South North Korea. Uh, the, the Moon administration is going down a very dangerous path here that is going to end in one country, two systems, in which North Korea is going to exert its nuclear hegemony to steadily, incrementally, without war occupation, 
piece by piece, exert the power to censor speech all the way to the, to the southern beaches of Chejudo. And don't believe for a minute that leaflets are where this will stop. They have threatened to shell the offices of newspapers in South Korea. They have uh, threatened to kill the president of South Korea in the past. They have tried to kill the president of South Korea in the past. Uh, they will never be satiated with just a little bit of censorship. They want everything. And uh, uh, they, they, they may settle for certain differences between the two political systems, but their aim is to control both of them. And Josh, of course, this is not a program about the gag law, but it has come up. Well, we could have one. Uh, my colleague Amanda Mortwedo reminds us that uh, just a few hours ago, the UN Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression and the UN Special Rapporteur um, for North Korean Human Rights, Tomaso Hea Quintana, actually issued a letter to uh, the Moon government addressing this particular very troubling issue of the gag law. Uh, my Colleague Rosa Park has been uh, patiently waiting. She has a question about the, the countering America's adversaries uh, through sanctions act, the CATSA. Will the Biden administration continue to enforce CATSA? And <clears throat> do you expect any changes to the law from the new administration or from Congress? Back to you, Josh. Uh, presidents always disappoint you, Rosa. So I, I suspect that President Biden will, like all the rest of them, eventually end up uh, being, um, you know, captivated by the State Department's interests, probably more than most. Uh, we know a lot about President Biden's record when he was in charge of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and he was very close to the State Department, followed their prerogative closely. So it will be up to someone in Congress to force the president to enforce the law. And I, uh, you know, looking at the current states of both political parties right now, I can't express a great deal of optimism. Uh, each of them, I think to some degree, is deciding whether the Democrats wanna be the party of AOC and the Republicans wanna be the uh, party of, uh, of uh, Marjorie Taylor, what's her name? Um, the one who believes in Jewish space lasers. So look, you're, you're going to have to find some coalition of reasonable, sensible people who want the president to enforce the law, who don't think that the more cowbell strategy of just asking North Korea to come back to talks again, you know, without having leverage over Pyongyang is going to work. Um, Look, the cats have passed by a veto-proof margin with hardly a vote in opposition. So did the Nick's Pia that came before it. So I think the, the hope is there that, that common sense will prevail. I also suspect that the North Koreans are going to do something stupid within the next few months that's going to help make this an easier decision for this new Biden administration Korea team uh, they're apparently in the final stages of doing a policy review. And I suppose right around the time they, you know, s suggest, you know, that, well, we've got it ready to go to the president. North Korea will do something to upset all of those careful discussions and negotiations. So uh, as, a, as, as a certain politician used to say, we'll see what happens. Well, Josh, before I uh, thank you and before we conclude, let me ask um, our friends to stay tuned and uh, remember that our next event is going to take place also via Zoom this coming Tuesday, April the 27th from 12 to 1 p.m. East Coast time here in the United States. It's an event co-hosted with the Coalition for Genocide Response. Um, the, it will feature... Uh, speakers including uh, Lord Alton of Liverpool and uh, Park Ji Hyun, North Korean escapee and activist who um, is actually running for office in the United Kingdom. So uh, we do hope that he can all join us. Uh, let me thank my colleagues Rosa Park and Amanda Mortwood O for their good and hard work. 
on this program. Uh, let me thank uh, all of our participants and friends for spending this meaningful uh, evening with us. And let me remind everyone that we do have another jaw stand report coming up. Several other very hopefully captivating HRNK reports. So thank you for staying with us. Thank you for joining us. And uh, first and foremost, Josh, of course, uh, this has been a truly meaningful time. Thank you for sharing your time and expertise and uh, please come back soon.